Hey everybody, how you doing? Samp Repair Guy. I'm going to shoot another video here, show you the different types of parts that you'd see in an RF amplifier. Um, you know, some some people have the right parts, some people don't have the right parts. You know, if you have the good parts, the parts that you should have, the amplifier should last and not break down. You should be able to use it for many, 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 many years without any issues. But um, you know, I just want to help educate some people to to uh, you know help them see uh, what's going on with the uh, the industry here so they can start asking questions and hopefully uh, get a little bit more educated and and uh, uh, you know when their amplifier breaks get it fixed the right way so they don't have to worry about it breaking again wasting money uh, if something's built right repaired right it should keep on working you shouldn't have to worry about it, it should be safe and you shouldn't have any issues for many years to come okay so you have different types of relays. Uh, I've been seeing this relay a lot for, well, actually for many years. People use it. It's a cheap way to implement a, uh, a relay for RF switching. It's not designed, the contacts on this are not designed to carry RF. Um, so, it's right there, that big open frame. They do have smaller open frame relays. They have shorter lead lengths that are su suitable for switching RF. Um, but I see this in, you know, larger amplifiers for switching the input and the output RF and people wonder why they, the contacts end up pitting and then they, um, they end up uh, either sticking, they fuse closed, or, you know, they, they worry about hot switching. Um, that's another subject. But um, the contacts really get, either get fused closed or they pit. And then they don't make a good enough connection. You can actually, if it's not fused closed, they'll still engage, and it'll, uh, the RF will pass through it. But um, the receive will be knocked down. It'll be attenuated quite a bit, bit because of the the buildup on the contacts. And then you have the problem with the lead length that I addressed in the other video with the high feed thrust of your. So these are the relays you should be using. Either uh, you know, for a lower power amplifier, you can use an open frame, um, or you can modify this if you really wanted to to save money on one of those. But still, you'd have to address the, you have to make sure that this does not hot switch at all. No relay should really hot switch. Uh, it's not good for the contacts, but something like this uh, just is, is, isn't going to be as forgiving. It's going to end up failing quicker. So I never use relays like this in a large amplifier. Anything um, above an 8877 always gets a vacuum. Even 8877s like to use vacuum relays. Um, uh, so, you know, you have different vacuum uh, relay sizes, RJ1A, RJ I don't remember what those uh, uh, part numbers are. That's a RF10B, and uh, I don't remember the middle one, but uh, rated for different amounts of current. The current rating is actually at 60 um, hertz. It's not um, at any frequency, so they're... As you go up in frequency, the current reading goes down, so you know it's easy to figure out the amount of current you have across the the relay contact. Um, just use Ohm's law. You know, if the amplifier is seeing a 50 ohm load, you just do the math, and obviously a contact can handle more current than it's rated for if it's not being used in a uh, CCS um, type application, you know, continuous um, use application. But um, and then you don't want a hot switch, obviously, if you can get away with it. But they're more forgiving than one of these relays and then the lead length's obviously shorter. Uh, I also use people, I, I mean I'm sorry, I see people using this type of relay for switching on and off power supplies. That's okay. Um, you know if you have the proper soft start you just don't want a massive amount of in inrush um, going across the contacts because over time pitting occurs and then uh, carbon buildup and um, it inhibits the, the connection. You don't have as good of a connection then you end up with resistance, it heats up. So um, I've seen this, and then that's like a standard contactor, but I prefer using mercury contactors in all of my amplifiers that I um, build uh, because um, you, know, you have the uh, contact that drops into a pool of mercury, so there's no arc, no spark, none of that stuff, and they last a long, long time. I've uh, only had one customer that had one fail ever, um, and that was due to a uh, uh, coil issue on the contactor. Okay, so um, you have uh, these are doorknob capacitors. Uh, they're used in different areas of uh, 
RF amplifier, uh, you know, plate blocker or, or bypass cap based plate choke or whatever. Um, I see a lot of people using capacitors that aren't rated for the, uh, they're, they're not rated for the, the um, application they're being used in. Like this one right here is not rated for a lot of current. And I see people using them as plate blockers. <laughs> they end up failing. Um, you have different sizes, different, you know, rated for different amounts of voltage current. Um, then you have uh, plate blocking, I'm sorry, so the plate blocking caps and you have the um, plate chokes. A lot of people like to wind them with Teflon. I don't know why they do that. Teflon emits a poisonous gas. If it were to become self-resonant, um, burn up, you can um, be, you could, you know, end up breathing in the poisonous gas. And also the insulation is thicker, so you end up needing more turns to get the same amount of inductance that you would with enamel wire. So, uh, you know, it's just, I don't know why people do it. It's, um, but, uh, so, moving on to the sockets. I see a lot of amplifiers, or, you know, like a 3CX3000 or 3CX6000, where they just ground the grid of the tube by using washers <laughs> instead of using a real socket. You know, because a real socket, you know, one of these new is around 300 bucks. These, I don't know if you can buy these new anymore, but... I prefer this socket over that socket. These are both 3, 3, 3, 000, 3CX 3000, 3, 3CX 6000 type sockets. So, um, you know, that's something to look out for. It's very important to have the grid securely grounded in a grounded grid triode amplifier, or even if you're running a tetrode like a triode, if you're grounding both grids, because you don't want the, um, the potential, you know, if the grid were to lift above ground, you could end up with the full plate potential across the cathode of the tube and um, okay so in the back we have a couple blowers um, you know on the IMAX spec sheet or Svetlana whatever tube you're uh, building an amplifier with you have the specifications it uh, specifies a certain CFM rating at a certain pre with, uh, with a certain amount of pressure output pressure from the blower um, you know people they look at the specs and they just think the CFM rating is what's matter what matters but you know, there are a lot of things that are involved when it comes to uh, picking the proper blower. You know, you have the ambient temperature in the room. You have the um, the total amount of anode dissipation. I mean, there are a lot of different factors. So, um, this is a low pressure blower. That means, you know, it provides a certain amount of CFM. It's like around 140 CFM. But when it has any sort of back pressure across the output um, here, the output flange. The CFM rating drops um, dramatically. So um, this blow over here, this is made by Coltronic, uh, yeah, Coltronics, and um, it maintains a higher pressure, a certain pressure. Um, I don't have the specs in front of me, but believe it or not, that blower produces more pressure, more CFM than that blower, even though it's smaller, but it costs a lot more money, and that's why a lot of people don't use the um, blower. So it's really important to keep the tube cool. Um, you want to follow the, the manufacturer's specs. Um, it's really not rocket science. You just want to follow the, their specifications and um, you know, the ratings they put right in. Published their published iMac data book. <laughs> it's really, so um, okay, another thing I see a lot is you know people building amplifiers with cheesy chimneys. Like I see people using Teflon. And they wrap it around the tube, and then they just drop it down on the floor. They secure like a wrap piece, and they rivet it together or whatever, and then they just drop it down, and it's not secured to the floor. Um, you don't have a good seal between the chimney. This one came out of an RF amplifier and has brackets on it to secure it to the floor. Um, also, it had, it had like a gasket material underneath it to stop air from um, escaping. But I see a lot of times they'll just have like something like this, but no bottom flange. It'll just drop down on the floor. Then if it chimney cocks sideways or something, you end up losing a lot of air between the chimney and the socket hole. So, um, really, I, I don't know why people do it. I mean, you can buy, this is the proper chimney for like a 3CX10 or a 3CX15, secures to the floor. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. But, you know, once again, people do that because it's cheaper. Um, so, okay, I'm going to talk about capacitors, okay? So, uh... You know, you have a, this is an air variable type capacitor, and just, just, you know, just because I don't have a lot of room right here, 
Um, I picked out a couple small vacuum capacitors. I love vacuum caps. So I use them in all my amplifiers, the input and output networks. Vacuum caps, you don't have to worry about air, I mean about uh, dust getting into the plates or into the contacts um, that the shaft rides on or any of that stuff. Um, they they have a they, they should last forever as long as you don't you don't ever want to crank one all the way to max or min like really hard you can end up damaging it but um, it should last forever you don't have to worry about any of that stuff I don't have to worry about any arcing issues or any of that stuff the problem is with an air variable cap you know um, just because it can handle the voltage doesn't mean it's going to handle the um, the amount of current you're putting on it you know you still have these these contacts you know these are only rated for so much current that's only rated for so much current. And that current rating differs depending on the frequency you're on, once again, you know. So, um, all boils down to the math, like I said, always does. So, um, you know, these will work, but they always end up eventually failing. Once once one arcs and you have like a carbon, you have carbon build up, and then it's just the, you know, the next time it arcs, it's going to happen easier. You know, it's going to, um, you, know, you can clean off the carbon, you end up with like a pit, it's like pit with carbon, and then... It just gets progressively worse, so I don't use air variables at all. I have boxes of them. Anyone ever needs one, I'm gonna start listing them on my website. So, okay, so um, talk about that. Now I have glitch resistors. I see a lot of people using little tiny resistors like this to act like a glitch. Ends up blowing open like a fuse. I have boxes of these on my corbs. I'll use this in like a 3000, or I have boxes of glow bar type. You know, cancel resistors, um, corundum or whatever you want to call them. Boxes and boxes, you know, like this one's a 200 ohm. We use four of those in parallel for a really big box. Um, you know, that I'm repairing or building or whatever. So, um, and then, uh, you know, so you just, it just blows out of the mouth. You want something in there that's going to um, survive the, uh, the glitch. You don't want it to blow apart like a fuse. You know, if you want a fuse, put in a high voltage fuse, you know, Busman high voltage fuse. Um, I, I like to fuse the um, uh, the B positive after the um, the uh, rectifiers, and then also uh, I put one between the um, the transformer secondary and the the uh, the rectifier for the plate supply to protect the transformers. Um, so okay, so now soft starts. I see a lot of people using like time delay soft starts. I use like, uh, this is just a fixed one, anywhere from half second to one second, depending on the resistor. Um, actually, yeah, you have to either short the two terminals or put a resistor in there and it alters the length of time uh, before it closes. Um, it's a delay on timer. So I see people with ones that are set to like five, ten seconds or whatever. I don't use this at all. I use um, I use the same method they use in broadcast transmitters and uh, some of the Ameritron amps where... Um, I'm not gonna get into it, but I use that 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 same style. It just uses a relay with a 240 coil and it, with a resistor in series and a fuse in series. Of that so, if um, you know, the short end to be positive, the resistor drops the the uh, the voltage to the um, the relay with the 240 contact, so it doesn't close. Which you know, if it doesn't close, then the um, the voltage uh, drops to the switch side of the plate primary and doesn't allow the um, Work your contactor to short out the resistor instead it just pops the fuse. Um, I can uh, provide a link to that soft start if anyone wants to just drop me an email. I'll, um, I'll, I'll show you uh, where you can find it. But so much better. So if your amplifier has a short on the B positive, pop a little two amp fuse. <laughs> you know, and it's almost instant. You turn your amplifier on, bam, it's on. Very little delay. Uh, you don't even see your lights flicker or anything. Um, otherwise, you'd have to rely, you know, if you had to shorten the B-positive upon startup, you'd have to rely on your, your main breaker to limit the the um, fault current, you know, to the short. Okay, so, um, let's talk about capacitors. I see a lot of people, I just heard of a guy, you know, he had uh, six of these in his amplifier. You know, these are rated for 450 volts. You know, um... I don't like using electrolytics. Um, you know, if I repair a hand amp that already has them in it, I'll re you know I'll replace them. But uh, a lot of manufacturers they get they they're right on the edge of um, what the rating 
you know, what the capacitors can handle. You know, let's say you had like six of them, 450 volts each, you know, like uh, 2700. Um, you know, that's that, you know, and they had 2500 volts on the supply, then that's, that's just too close. Um, you know, I, I would add a couple more in series. They just, I, I don't like, you know, and I see a lot of times people have a bunch of these in series and they don't have um, the proper resistor across each one, a loading resistor, you know, bleeder loading, so they're not equalizing the voltage across each one, or, you know, like, they're either not the right, either they're, they're not the right um, ohm value or voltage rating, one fails, and then one cap ends up with more voltage across it, and then um, flashes between the, um, you know, inside the cap through the insulation, then cap shot, and you should replace all of them. So, um, I also see people using you know, they should also be isolated from each other and ground if you're... Anytime you're running a cap in series where one cap or any of the caps um, can't withstand the, the total voltage that they have across all of them, you have to isolate them from each other and ground. So I also see people using pulse rated, like high energy discharge capacitors. Those aren't rated for... Um, really for RF amplifier use. I mean, you have to derate them considerably. You're supposed to run them at like 60% or so of their their maximum rating. Uh, otherwise, you know, they'll, they'll heat up and they can end up failing. That back there is a, um, you know, it's a general electric capacitor. Um, it's rated for a broadcast application. And there's a reason why they're, they're bigger. You know, this, once again, I have ones that are huge. You can see them on my website. That's just, I'm limited to space right here. I still have a bunch of amplifier work that came in the other day. So um, I just don't have the room to place a bunch on my, my bench here. But um, so here's a connector. You know, it's an ancient 5 8 panel. I see a lot of people doing crazy stuff. They'll have like a bullet on the back of the amp or they mount the line section right to the back of the amplifier and they don't get a good ground connection um, with some of the stuff I've seen done. So this just give you an idea. Some stuff here. Um, you know, soft start. I, I'm not the best at explaining things, but... You know, if anyone wants to uh, find out more about that, just drop me a message um, through my website or give me a call. But, um, yeah. So, I'm just sick of seeing people getting ripped off. Uh, it's really not um, not cool. Like I said, if something's built right, it should keep working. You shouldn't have to worry about it. You know, when I go to build an amplifier, I have the ability to high pot everything. I have a, uh, shown on my site. I have a Hypotronics high pot tester here. I don't know if I pronounce that. Hypotronics. <laughs> and like I said, here's the spec sheet for 36 3000. See, you have airflow, CFM, pressure drop in inches. All the ratings. If you follow the book, for all the specs, the tube should last many, 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 many years. Many, many. So, I have all the, all the information for all the iMac tubes here. Multiple iMac spec books. Triodes, tetrodes, rectifiers, everything. So, hey, right, well, thanks for watching and Many more videos to come. Have a blessed day.